All right, um, welcome everyone. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I, I guess as most of you have a, a already, oh, by the way, could you see my screen? Yeah. So, okay. Um, as most of you probably are aware, um, there was a structure prediction competition recently. Um, and here is sort of a, a slide that kind of des describes the different results across the different groups. Uh, and what this is showing here is how well each group did. And the higher the number, the better. And so what we saw is that DeepMind uh, did a really, really good this, this year compared to the second best group, which is uh, David Baker's group. Uh, but everything else is re relatively flat. So the question is, what did exactly did they did like when they got from here to here? And did they solve the protein folding problem? I guess is another big question. Um, and and this is a, a, something I saw on Twitter. I thought was kind of funny that I, I thought share. So your Pactor asked the question uh, because supposedly DeepMind solved the protein folding problem. Does that prove that P equals NP? Just because protein folding is one of those classic problems that is thought to be uh, NP hard or NP complete. Uh, and so, question: Did they solve the problem? And these numbers look really good in terms of a really high GDT. Uh, if we actually compare them to say like the second best group. So here what I'm showing here is each dot here is a different target, uh, different protein. Uh, X axis is Baker group, Y axis is alpha fold. And if you're above this line, uh, you did better than the Baker group. So almost consistently uh, alpha fold did better. And another thing I wanna point out is if you're above this line here or GT of 90, you are effectively have considered to have solved the structure I mean, these are structures that are now at the level of, uh, of almost experimental error. But if you're below the line, then you didn't really solve the problem yet. So I guess even though on average they did much better and then also did much better than the second best group uh, for every single target, except for one here. So it looks like we still have a chance of beating them. Uh, but otherwise it, on average, they did really good, uh, but there are still plenty of cases that they didn't do that well on. So like all these examples would be considered to have not solved the problem. Um, and so, so there's still uh, improvements to be made. Um, there are people that are arguing that maybe some of these might be borderline where maybe there's experimental error or maybe some different conditions may have actually, uh, so like they predicted the alternative state. I think there's at least one protein here that is thought to be metamorphic. And so people are wondering if, if it's, they actually predicted like the alternative state of that protein and so that's why it looks incorrect, but maybe they actually are correct. Um, and so, so the question is what exactly happened and how did they get to the state where they're much better, the second best group, and many of the targets are now above this line where, and actually most of the targets are above this line for which you consider to be solved. Maybe I'll, I'll jump into okay. a couple of points here. Yeah, I mean, I so I mean, I think one thing to say is, is I, ninety is not like a magical number, right? So that ultimately, there, there's I mean, and you see things way above ninety there too. And, and and by the same token, I think like you know eighty isn't either. So I, I do think, I, I think that the ninety above below is a little bit of an artificial thing. Um, maybe the way to think about it is, is more like you know fifty is something like the, the right fold. So, so, so 50 is not garbage. You're, you're, definitely, you're definitely getting something that looks kind of like what you want, but it's, the details are all wrong. 70 is sort of like the details are getting to be there, but like the side chains are all off and that kind of thing. And 90, 90 is where it gets to be a bit sort of tricky to say whether this is, you know, the fact that it's a crystal packing artifact or, or the structure or the prediction is wrong, right? So it gets a little bit ambiguous. Um, but but I, don't, I, don't, I don't, at least personally, think there's something particularly magical about 90. Uh, quick, uh, quick question. Um, is it known in past casts uh, what percentage of the proteins were metamorphic? Uh, it just got me thinking reading a, this article from in Science this week about metamorphic proteins. Uh, just to elaborate, basically proteins that have multiple folds. Uh, I, I believe it's relatively rare. I'm not. Sh I'm, I'm sure someone's done the, uh, but I don't know off the top of my head how many of them should be. Uh, but in, I, I guess just a uh, one uh, extra comment based on what Mohammed said, uh, 90 sort of has been this number that people have been quoting, like we have to reach this number before the problem is solved. Um, whether or not that should be the number we should be hitting at and whether or not if, we, if we're loaded in that is still a useful model. Uh, so for example, at 50, like Mohammed was saying, if you get to 50%, you got effectively the correct fold. Uh, and that's very useful for potentially predicting the function of the protein 
um, and start maybe using it as an initial point in um, refinement with some kind of experimental data. Uh, so it's not necessarily that these models are useless to an extent, but once you hit 90, you're getting to now the details where now this model may actually be useful for uh, various uh, drug uh, targeting various aspects or protein design uh, aspects. Um, okay, so. Sorry, sorry, Sergey, could I okay. ask a quick question? Um, so in vivo, what is the rough amount of wiggle, for lack of a more technical term, uh, like if you were to do like an MD simulation of one of these proteins, like to, to what extent, like is is 90, if not a magic number, starting to get into in, that vicinity? So is that what you mean by experimental error? Yeah, yeah. So so once you get to about 90, you're, you're now in that region where if you wiggle the protein, you'll be sort of moving around in this region here. Yeah. There's a, another thing to kind of maybe point out here is there's an, there's an issue with, with whether the errors have localized or delocalized, right? Um, you know, the crystallographic structure is when people talk about an, an angstrom resolution, um, you know, often that's because there are some parts that are unresolved. But if you look at the well-resolved parts, usually the, the, the coordinate error is really on the order of like 0.2 angstroms, right? Which would be like 95 or 97 here. Um, so so it's, it's, it, while in these cases, you know, typically the error is really much more kind of distributed. It's not, I mean, well, even that is not so clear, but, but it, gets, it gets a bit complicated, right? it, you know, for those reasons. I think if you are trying to design a small molecule that binds an active, active site or something, um, you, you really do want to be in the sub angstrom resolution. And so, so that would be, I think, more akin to like 95 or 97 for that, for that region. Um, so so I, I think, as, as Sergey was alluding to, it, it really becomes, I think, now a question of what application you're trying to address. Because depending on that application, 50 might be good enough, um, or 70, or 90, or 95, or what have you. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yes, uh, it's it's definitely possible. Like you got the whole protein right, and you got one, like one little tail wrong, and that might have pushed you out over. Versus, on average, everything's slightly wrong, which would be uh, that's something this metric is not uh, addressing. Um, all right. So, so another question is, what exactly do they do? And and I put this little slide here just because, um, just for the people who are not really thinking about the, what the protein folding problem is. Uh, so we know inside the cell, we go from DNA, RNA to amino acid sequence, and the sequence folds up into some structure. And, and the question is, can we take the amino acid sequence and uh, get a 3D structure? We know it happens in the cell really, really fast, but the question is, can we do the same thing inside the computer? Uh, and whatever AlphaFold did, is this what they actually did? Did they go from single sequence to structure, or did they introduce more additional data into this computer? Um, and so just to, to go through an example of a structure prediction pipeline, uh, so a typical pipeline in CASP 11 or so would be to take a, multi a single sequence, search against a database of sequence and construct a, a multiple sequence alignment. Uh, and then you could stare at this multiple sequence alignment and look at maybe patterns of conservation, patterns of variability, uh, patterns of covolution, and start to pull out lots of information about this protein. Like single protein, you could probably do some, look at it and look at some chemistry, uh, but a multiple sequence alignment actually gives you a lot of information. Uh, and one bit of information that's been really uh, well utilized in, in CASP 11 is to look at multiple sequence alignments and look for patterns of covolution uh, or covariation uh, and, and extract contacts from that. Um, and it turns out if you have contacts, you could actually uh, do a really good job at predicting structure from that. Uh, and so typically the pipeline would be to take uh, the multiple sequence alignment, get a multi uh, PSSM, a conservation, predict the secondary structure, look at a database of fragments, get a bunch of fragments, use the contacts, use the fragments to do folding. So you sort of recombine these fragments and this is sort of like a typical Rosetta ab initio protocol. Um, if you take this PSSM and you search against the, the whole PDB, you may actually find some templates. And so another typical protocol would be to take these templates and hybridize them with fragments to create a final structure. Uh, and so these are sort of two tasks. One would be referred to as like the free modeling task where you have no template information. And if you do have template information, you can actually do a much better job by effectively just stealing uh, uh, these templates uh, and, and use, it, use them in, in the structure prediction pipeline. Uh, so this is sort of a, a typical uh, CASP 11 pipeline that was one of the winning strategies. Uh, of course, people used neural networks throughout here in other groups, but this is sort of on average what I like to think is uh, what was being used. Uh, what happened in CASP, uh, 13, so I'm just skipping one cast ahead, this is what AlphaFold did, was they effectively decided, you know what, instead of going through contacts, like 
taking a Markov random field, a POTS model that you infer with various algorithms uh, and taking these contacts and doing folding, why don't we just pass this entire Markov random field to uh, a residual network and from that extract dihedrals uh, and predict distances um, and use that information to minimize and create a structure. Or alternatively, you could sort of learn some variational autoencoder that encodes all of fragment space and then combine these fragments with the distances to predict the structure. Um, and so they actually tried both uh, procedures and they actually found that they both worked almost equally well. Um, and so they, they, they were suggesting that this would be the way to go. You could just effectively just take um, a neural network and replace uh, this part here and effectively replace a lot of these parts. And the other thing is once you have this information, you literally start with some uh, initial coordinates and you just minimize into the right structure. So, th so this was CASP uh, 18. And what happened the next CASP was to almost completely replace even this procedure here. So you, you go with the multiple sequence alignment, you pass that directly to some kind of neural network that outputs initial coordinates. Uh, the other thing that you could pass in is the template information as well. So now you, you, can use, use the, you can use the template information, you can use the multiple sequence alignment information, pass it to the network, get some initial coordinates, pass it to another neural network that then uh, does um, refines these coordinates and gives you back the final coordinates that you want. Uh, one thing I forgot to emphasize here is that everything here was done almost end to end and that we the, this whole going from here to here is all optimizing a single graph. Um, so instead of doing like, so often when people develop past protocols, so if we go back a few slides, um, each sort of step was sort of optimized independently of all the other steps. Um, and here effectively all of this Every single step here along here was replaced with which almost a single computation graph. Um, and I think I'll stop here to, uh, to ask, uh, let people ask questions or if Mohammed wants to add to what I just said. Uh, what is, did you have, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, what is an attention-based neural network? Could you give uh, an overview of that? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, the attention-based mechanism is, um, you can almost think of it as almost looking at co-evolution to some extent. So at least this is my interpretation of it. So the idea is you could, um, actually, let me see if I, if I can explain this a little better. Actually, Mohammed, do you want, you want to give it a go? I, mean, I was going to, yes, I was trying okay. to find the slide. You don't happen to have their, their like the slide they presented, do they? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to pull it up that's right a, that's now. That's a good idea. Maybe we could just jump to that slide. Um, there we go. This one here. Right, okay. Actually, Mohammed, do, do you want to try to explain this one? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so, so, so the left part, the embedding part is essentially what, what, what Sigge has already talked about. So the, I think that's all reasonably in you know, the templates and the MSA and so on. Um, what, what sort of starts to get interesting, you know, starts to get interesting is in the trunk side. So, um, as, as Sigge mentioned, you know, typically speaking, you know, all the kind of co-evolution based approaches would take that MSA, that sort of raw multiple sequence alignment and essentially extract summary statistics about pairwise correlations between, between new residues, between pairs of, between pairs of residues. Um, what they seem to be doing here instead is, is, is not to do that, not to extract summary statistics, uh, but to sort of keep the raw object um, and, this, and instead use this idea of an attention mechanism to iteratively attend over that, that raw object. Um, so, so, so what attention essentially is, is a way to um, is sort of flexibly examine or observe different parts of, of some object and then essentially decide whether that part is relevant to sort of the current, mm -hmm. the, the current question you're trying to solve. Um, the way this is typically formalized is that you have this notion of a key and a query. Um, so if you have like a sentence, every word would, have, would, would be associated with a query and a key, and then you can compare every, every word to every other word in that sentence. And based on that comparison, you sort of decide um, how information ought to flow for any given word in terms of, you know, if you're trying to make a decision, for example, if there's some sort of, um, you know, attachment, does this word refer to that object or something like that? Um, so in this case, what appears to be happening is, um, at least if you focus on the MSA side, they're, they're sort of iteratively um, operating on this MSA, they're, they're, they're changing in some way. And the way they change that is at every step, 
for every sequence in the MSA, they attend to all the other sequences and bas based on what they observe there, um, sort of update the, 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 a new version of that MSA. That's, that's sort of the, the top part, the, the stuff in pink. The stuff in blue has more to do with kind of this more familiar object, this sort of distogram or, or, or it's essentially pairwise distances between, between residues, where here again, instead of sort of doing a single shot where they just predict it based on the POTS model, they now sort of iterate back and forth between the MSA and the, um, and the pairwise distances, again, using this attention mechanism where they're sort of looking at the MSA based on what, what they see there, they update the, um, the, the pairwise distances. And now based on the updated pairwise distances, they use that to sort of iterate on the MSA and, and, and so on and so forth, back and forth. Um, so so that, that part, I think is sort of, well, in my opinion, I think that's the part that's probably what gave them the biggest uh, sort of lift in terms of to the performance. I think Sergey thinks the structural module, the one he, he sort of referred to with the equivariant network, that is, that is I, I think, Sergey, you think that's kind of the, the bigger piece. Um, I mean, Ubain, Ubain CPC, obviously, we were sort of speculating here on which one, which one was more important. Perhaps they were both equally important. Um, yeah. I think, uh, Debbie, you wanted to say something? I, I, th I thought I'm I gonna heard write you. it in the thing instead. OK, no problem. Um, yeah, so, so uh, I, I guess Mohammed said a lot of things just now. Um, but uh, one way to sort of think of attention, I guess, maybe just to look at this little plot here. So here, you imagine you have a sequence. This is just a, a single protein here, just kind of stretched out. And one question you might wonder is like, who is at uh, attending to who? And so you can almost think of this right here, that this matrix right here is telling you who, uh, which amino acid is connected to which amino acid. Um, and from this perspective, that's why I was sort of alluding to that it might be coevolution because in some ways, when you take a multiple sequence alignment and you construct a, a, a effectively a dot product of that or get a covariance matrix. Exactly. Um, and if you invert that covariance matrix, you got pretty much the covolution that a lot of people have been using. But instead of inverting it, you could probably use something like softmax to try to pick out the most important signal. Um, so you could say, who is who, which amino acid is connected to the other, and I guess in the largest amount um, and supposedly, if you iterate this enough time, the network could potentially learn to extract the coevolution signal. So um, what I suspect is actually happening here is that the, the neural network is um, taking the sequence information um, and integrating potentially the template information as, as priors to tell you, okay, which amino acid is connected to which, update the multiple sequence alignment, re-extract the contacts, update the multiple sequence alignment, re-extract the contacts, and you sort of iteratively adding more and more information and potentially removing stuff. Because one thing that happens with a lot of these collusion algorithms is that they don't know that they're acting on a protein um, and they don't know what the end goal is except to potentially reconstruct the sequence that it's starting with. Um, if you say, hey, the end goal is to do a structure prediction, it may actually start to introduce various priors into the model and potentially extract the more relevant signal that may be useful for structure prediction, but maybe not useful for maybe other applications that people are using uh, these models for, um, yeah. I, mean, I suspect, and I think I think they kind of alluded to this. I mean, they, they did they did say that they never explicitly uh, calculate sort of covariance, but I, I think I mean you're right. I mean, almost certainly this is something that's being sort of presumably learned by the model. But I think the the kind of the iterative attention is probably allowing them to um, well to potentially kind of filter and, and refine the MSA, right? So you're, you're you know in some ways I think the MSAs we extract today are 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 noisy, right? And so so presumably this sort of approach allows them to, to actually, if, if nothing else, but I suspect that it gets them more than that, but if nothing else, gives them sort of much, much better MSAs uh, to actually sort of base the, the covariance uh, information on. I think Debbie really wants yeah, to okay. say something. So I so just wanted to say that, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, you seem to, I think you may have a paper saying the same point, Sergey. I probably haven't read all the papers recently, but um, <clears throat> when we did the VAE paper, uh, looking for using it for probabilistic, you know, mutation effect prediction, Actually, I don't know whether we put it in, it might be in a supplement, but when you look at the latent space and the sort of the nodes uh, of the sort of whatever the, the, the size of the space is and you do correlations of those, you get back the contact map and that's in the VAE, right? <laughs> so in that latent space is the information about all sorts of distances. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me if something more like a, an attention-based thing had it, which is just the dot product between uh, the, the two matrices, the input and the transform of that with the weights, right? 
Yes, exactly. And the, the fact that they sort of preserve the multiple sequence alignments the whole time um, and use that as uh, to construct a single uh, L by L matrix um, makes me think that it's effectively just computed covariance and the softmax is just approximating the inverse to some extent. Um, okay, so uh, I guess actually, sorry, let me start sharing my slides again. Um, um, can I, oh, can I oh, ask? Go ahead. Uh, -huh. uh did they ever disclose or like hint on uh like how many like whether there was like multiple attention heads or something like that i know that's an approach that's been used in the natural language processing right that gave a, like a huge boost to the performance of the models i wonder if some of those attention heads were like m more close to the actual contact maps while other might then encode some other sorts of like interactions between the residues, uh, if that makes sense. I would love to hear anyone comment on that, on that or if that's stupid. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's a really good point. So, I mean, attention heads could be thought of as almost capturing different kinds of contacts. Um, one thing we, we saw in the past was that you can effectively sort of compress uh, uh, a collusion model by saying, well, there's only five possible ways that amino acids can interact with each other. And those attention heads could be thought of sort of capturing these five different ways. Um, they didn't actually say um, whether or not these, they, how many heads they used here. Um, the whole time they kept showing these L by L matrices. Um, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was more than a single head going on around here. Um, what one thing, um... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with Sigi. One, one thing to add here is, is um, yeah. It so it doesn't stop here, right? And this is a point that the Sigi kind of made earlier that this this then gets fed into a structure module that is operating in sort of in Cartesian space and um, and 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 is using this particular equivariant architecture to sort of iterate the structure. So presumably in that stage, at least, right? If you have, you know, I mean, there's, there's a good point to be made here, which is in the kind of this sort of um, you know MSA slash histogram ping pong going back and forth that is sort of fundamentally a pairwise object, right? But obviously once you get to the Cartesian space representation, th then there potentially you could have things that are really operating uh, or that are say observing or reasoning over kind of higher levels of coordination, right? Where you have potentially multiple residues coming together in one particular, um, you know, say region or something like that. So at least in, in so far as that's concerned, you know, some of that signal can be captured in this structural module. And because the entire thing is being backpropped through Presumably, that sort of thing is actually useful to again further refine the the histograms that are being derived, right? So, so there's a sort of um, it, it, it's both in the explicit structure, but also in the kind of implicitly in terms of how it back back propagates to the rest of the network. All right. Any, any other questions or points? Oh yeah, Debbie, go for it. Um, sorry, if everybody has one or wants to move on, I, I don't know how many more slides you have. So I just didn't hear the very beginning and apologies if you said this, but I was curious because I wasn't there and didn't watch the uh, slides or anything, uh, uh, where the gain was. Was it distributed over all types of models and all types of predictions or was it uh, bigger over some kinds of models and some kinds of challenges than others when you compared it to say Baker? Ah, sorry. So, so that was specifically just for uh, single st uh, structure prediction. Um, so there were many, many different challenges, but AlphaFold only participated in one of the challenges, which is to predict uh, the single- uh, I, think, I think Debbie didn't see a first slide, so, okay, so maybe it's worth showing- There's a single oh, structure- scatter plot. Right, right. Oh, I see what you're asking, sorry. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought you were maybe. asking if, you know, so, so for, for, sorry, for the presentation- Oh, the scatter plot is the one, sorry. Uh, Oh, you're talking oh, about like two, two slides for yeah this one. I think that's the most useful ah, one. Yeah. So so this this is all the targets. This is all the targets, not all the divided targets, by easy or hard. include ones that you can detect, however badly, by um, sequence homology or. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Right? I mean. So do we know if you did the compute if you did the numbers on this where the most gain was, on say, T R Rosetta, or whatever the Baker one was. Um. So it's a little bit. Um, difficult to tell at the moment because what happens, they use a few other sequence databases that we didn't actually use. Um, they used uh, EBI um, uh, metagenomic data. Uh, we used American databases. Um, and it turns out they actually sampled quite different environments and they're not all in the same location. Um, so it's a little hard to tell at the moment uh, without us reconstructing the alignment exactly from the same sources they use 
how many sequences do you have for, for example, to be able okay. to- And I agree with you, that's like how big is a ball, you know, how many balls a string to reach the moon. The difference between a homology model and not is, is moot anyway, mm -hmm. but um, it still could yeah. be, I just wondered if it was very clear from the results that it was more about getting the good homology models than it was about really ones that had very, I just don't know. I just wondered if there was any analysis done in that respect. Well, respect. So there is actually, there is one. So I don't know if I can pull it up. I wish I had this earlier. Oh, yeah, sorry. Let me... um, no, I don't think you get it. I'm, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to find it that quickly. Um, ugh. Let me, I'll just, I'll just say it. So uh, yeah, the uh, Zhang group, they, they did do an analysis. So I, I, my understanding, I asked him twice. I, I hope he was correct. He said that they use the same data, the same set of databases that uh, AlphaFold2 did. So and Magnify and uh, BFD and, and the other stuff. And, and there at least, they did not actually see any, cor any correlation as far as I remember between the MSA depth and the performance and the quality of the prediction. Uh, MSA depth, I didn't mean, I meant whether there was a structure that you could detect by sequence. Right, so- oh, Whether well, there's a structural homologue, you mean? Exactly. So, yeah, what, what, I, what I just posted in the, in the chat is a link to the, the CAS website where you can see if you sort by just FM, which is free modeling, which has no templates whatsoever, okay. um, they still kick ass. No, no, of course. Did they kick ass more in that? Or can we say anything about where it kicks ass more is what I'm really trying to ask. I mean, I, I, I have the numbers. I, I actually should, should, I can do that and I'll speak quickly, but, but at least what I could say, I mean, so I want, I, I can't really answer your, your exact question, but, but what is the case mm -hmm. is that there were many instances which were like complete crap by everybody else, like, you know, GDT of like 20. Right. And they right. got these up to like 80. Yeah, that's what I heard. And that's what I was wondering about. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, in terms of like the, 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 if you just average, it's hard to say, but, 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 it's, but it's pretty clear that even very poor, I mean, the, the worst structure was like 60. And I think they had like fifth, only five structures below 70 out of, you know, 100. And then 95 okay. were over, over 70. So it was, it was a, I mean, it's pretty, yeah. Well, it's still a tiny, tiny amount of structures, isn't it, Casp? Just saying. Yeah, yeah so, 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 so. I guess for those of you who are kind of uh, wondering what the heck we're talking about, so, so, so the point here is that at the end of the day, um, they still used information. So it didn't go from single sequence to structure. They used multiple sequence alignment information. They used template information. And the question Debbie was asking, at what point when, when they, uh, for cases that they did really well on, how often were templates actually helpful? And, and maybe what Hamad, Mohammed was alluding to, there, was a lot, there seems to be not a strong correlation to the number of sequences available. Uh -huh. Um, right. But, it wouldn't be if you have a structure, it wouldn't mm -hmm, be, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, right. so in some ways you would want to potentially, like, let's say if, we, if I was to redo this analysis, uh, it would, one useful thing would be to sort of color these maybe, which ones had templates, which one had a lot of sequences yes. and so on, that would have been. And then the useful. distance to the line, yes. Well, when John, the, John Malt, he has- What Mohammed was trying to say actually about, what, what did say about, you know, where is, if we're thinking about where, is the advance right and we want to see where it is in the algorithm and the pipeline then it's worth knowing if there's anything in that that we can glean right if you see what i mean right so so in, in some ways uh sorry for me apologies i'm going through these slides again here um the no that's, that's a really good point but um so so i guess what i was trying to illustrate with the slides here is that there is a lot of things that were sort of used that the uh, community already knew. Um, so community knew that multiple sequence alignments were useful. They knew templates were useful. They knew that if you had coordinates and you sort of refine these coordinates, you can do much better job. Um, and so in some ways they sort of neuralized a, a large aspect of this. Um, one thing that I'm predicting the next cast is they'll try to potentially neuralize this as aspect as well. So like this whole sequence search, uh, maybe also neuralize the template search aspect and then maybe make it completely full end to end. Um, in fact, actually, let me just skip a little bit forward here. As, as far as the future goes, um, it's still not completely end to end because they are using additional information that are not completely neuralized, but one you could imagine potentially using some kind of a language model to, to learn all of the sequence space and sort of compress all the uh, collusion information in one location and just effectively start looking it up. Um, but then maybe in the future, future, it would be nice to just start with a single sequence and get a structure. And I'm not just saying this from a technical point of view of being able to 
construct a model that goes from sequence to structure, but hopefully one day the neural network will be able to capture something about physics and not actually just effectively extracting all the information it could possibly find and doing the best at that uh, task. Um, but one thing we don't yet know yet is because the model is not released, the code is not released, they haven't published any ablation studies. Like one thing would be really cool to know is like, okay, you cut this information, you cut this information, how does it perform? Um, and that's something we will only know uh, maybe at least half a year from now. Um, yeah, and one thing I mean- and They did kind of try, they did try from the start to not do multiple sequence alignments. They did try with uh, transformer type models where the input is not in an alignment. They tried that for about six months apparently. So um, <clears throat> they couldn't get that to work, needed the alignment. Well, I mean, the, the transformer is still cheating because that effectively is just memorizing all the, the POTS models out there. So, so in that case, it wouldn't be expected <laughs> to do anything better. Um, so it's, I, I would consider that also be cheating just as much as using multiple sequence alignment. Yeah, but it's um, not, if you don't put them in, if you just say, here's my query and here's the universe of all sequences, right? All sequences, not my family, all sequences. Mm -hmm. But I mean, then that wouldn't be cheating, right? Necessarily. Well, I mean, you could you could either sort of learn a whole bunch of separate models and then store them in the hard drive, or to have a neural network that sort of compresses all those models for you. It's effectively the same thing. I, I would, agree. I would argue. I agree. Um, but I, I mean, I think the question. Sorry, there's, there's a couple okay, of things that came sorry. up. I think the question there would. I mean, I, I think you're right, but I, I also think you know it's, it's possible that, that these transformer models or other like models are able to sort of learn something. Um, a, a bit more sort of um, general, right? And so and the, and the question there is, are you able to actually fill in kind of the missing pieces, right? Are, are you able to, to do more for parts of sequence space that are really very, very sparse and you don't have anything like a like an MSA there, right? So, so if, you, if you're able to do something different there than, than kind of a straight MSA approach, then I think that's a demonstration that this transformer-based right. architecture is And that's is doing precisely something. what needs to be shown. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I did, hasn't been shown. I mean, it's interesting that, that what you're saying, David. I didn't know that they spent six months trying that. Yeah, that's what they told me, <laughs> whether that was true. <laughs> okay, interesting. Um, um, if so you guys are back. curious, I can, I can send a quick link. So, so there was a recent study uh, done by a group. Um, let me see if I actually you know what. Let me just share the screen here really quick for you guys. Um, there, there was a study done where people sort of took transform models trained across many, many sequences and asked the question, do they learn contacts? Um, and, and this isn't with some kind of supervision, like taking attention and learning some supervision. It's literally just looking at the attention and saying, asking the question, do these attention maps match to contacts? Um, and what they saw, uh, at least to me, that was actually telling me that it's effectively the same thing as learning a bunch of uh, a mark of random fields, uh -huh. is that there is still a strong correlation to number of sequences. And uh -huh. Let me see if I can share that to you guys. Here we go. Uh, so this is showing. Um, this is an algorithm that does collusion analysis. This is the transformer model. And this is the number of sequences in the multiple sequence alignment. Mm -hmm. And you see it, actually a pretty strong correlation to the number of sequences that family has uh, versus the contact accuracy. Um, and I mean, there are, it is does slightly better when there's less sequences than let's say a collusion model, but there's still a pretty strong correlation. Um, and it does seem to maybe understand something better about sequence separation because smaller sequence separation it appears to to do better, and that yeah. kind of makes sense if you add addition like add some positional information and so on. Um, I mean, this is in some ways not surprising. I mean, I mean, I think all these sort of machine learning, I mean, almost all deep learning models, they sort of they both memorize and they generalize, right? And there's usually some sort of mixture of, of both. I mean, even mm -hmm. even with these kind of really impressive GPT three like models, they, they actually have memorized a ton of stuff, right? Um, and, and that's, I mean, I mean, I think that's the equivalent of what you're talking about here, right? Where it's essentially just giving you uh, a POTS model, but but then it, it also does other other things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so I mean, I, I think oh, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't necessarily think it's bad. I suppose. It's, it's, I mean, from a practical perspective, if you're just trying to get this because to work, if you don't have to manipulate it, then in end-to-end -end words, then it's good, right? right. Let's say. But yeah, that's I mean, what I meant before about the VAE, that the variation ultimately, although they're fuzzy and they're known as bad, we still saw the contacts, right? <laughs> It was very clear. We didn't publish that. No. All right. So, okay. what, what are, um, so one other kind of just question I want to put out there because to me it's a bit intriguing, right? So, so, so like I was saying earlier, I mean, there, there are some claims that are being made, including by them, that they're able to do well for for very shallow MSAs, you know, with ones that are just like ten sequences or something like that. Um, 
I do wonder, you know, if you imagine sort of a training regiment where essentially, you know, the, the most, the, 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 the deepest MSA you give for any sequence is in the order of 10, of, of 10 sequences, would it be able to learn as well as, as what they've learned? Like, 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 I guess the point here, and maybe this kind of goes back to this idea of a language model, is uh, do, do the deeper MSAs allow you to learn certain aspects of sort of protein structure or protein sequence structure correlations that are, that are then useful in instances where you actually have shallow MSAs? Uh -huh. because, because that would be sort of an interesting uh -huh. thing, right? If that's, if, that, if that's happening. I, I don't know if it's happening, but it's sort of a, a question. Um, actually, this kind of leads to a, a, a slide that I made telling, so sort of describing other things that you could potentially capture from multiple sequence alignment. Uh, so let me just quickly show uh, one little slide here. Uh, so, so it turns out that um, predicting structure from sequence is relatively hard. Um, and just to illustrate one example here, uh, here is a single stretch of amino acids that in one protein is a sheet and another protein is a helix. Um, and in fact, if you take this sequence and you try to do secondary structure prediction, this is just using single sequence, it thinks this is a sheet and it also thinks this is a sheet. But what happens if you add a multiple sequence alignment information, it's able to now say this is a helix uh, uh, and this is a sheet. Uh, it turns out one thing that multiple sequence alignment information gives you, even if it knows nothing about contacts, even if it's not detecting contacts, is that it tells you what your environment is. So if, if, you're, if your neighbors are uh, different in certain ways, you may probably tell, tell you something about yourself as well. So depending on how you mutate, you may actually be able to tell, are you a helix or are you a sheet, uh, even though the single sequence may actually have adapt different conformations. Um, and so, so uh, even if you have like five sequences, you may, you're actually adding a whole bunch of new information that you didn't know before, even if you don't have enough sequence to extract collusion information. Um, a few other papers that I'm coding here, I, I could actually send you guys the slides, but um, there, in the past, people have also shown that even if, if you have two sequences, like just two sequences, um, you can actually smooth out the energy landscape and the computer and potentially do a much better job at ab initio folding. Uh, because if you have a single sequence, you, and if you have two sequences, that's a lot of information that tells you both of these sequences fold into the same structure. Um, and there has been work done showing that you can actually use that to do a much better ab initio structure, even with just two sequences. Um, and so in some ways you could say this is actually adding a lot of information besides just uh, contact. Um, I, I want to come back to what Mohammed said because um, if, uh -huh. if it's okay to talk. Of course, yes, let me okay, stop okay. sharing. Mohammed, I, I actually liked what you said um, because for me it's like, well, is there anything to learn if we look at the universe of sequences in some very clever way that we don't know how to do heuristically, but we can set up machines to do it. If we look at those, are there patterns of dependencies that we can learn about then translating to where we don't have a deep MSA? That's a kind of deep question, right? I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> That's what yeah. you're asking. Yeah. And, and it's hard because we don't know the answer, right? Um, oh, but, but, it, but it's maybe testable in some way. Like I was saying, if you, if you sit up, yeah, yeah. Testable, exactly, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't know yeah. if they'll test it. <laughs> uh, the, 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 no, but I think yeah. one could test that. One could test about that in all sorts of ways with also, I mean, you know, we don't need them to do some language models and some end-to-end -end modeling. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> you all right, can well, do it. Come on. I kind of feel like we're <laughs> dominating the discussion here. Does anyone else have any questions okay. or thoughts they'd like to share? Um, if anything we're saying is confusing, we're, we'll be happy to go through it. I think we're, we're maybe bouncing around to a little too much. Is there any suspicion that it was a consequence of what sequences were being employed above maybe the equivariant component of the model that allowed this improvement in structure prediction? Or is it more suspected that it is simply the, the model difference? Because you mentioned that they were incorporating these, um, these metagenomic databases as well. Yeah, so, so there actually, that's a, let, me, let me go back to the slides really quick. Um, so what I'm going to do is, is just to show a few slides that are actually from DeepMind. So these are not slides that I've made. Um, and in these slides, what I'm showing here is that we're going from uh, sequences, multiple sequence alignment. We're doing some kind of uh, uh, attention-based information to extract pairwise information, um, and then constructing some kind of structure and getting a structure at the end. And Mohammed, I believe, thinks that this is the most important part. I actually think that this might be more 
what actually drove them over. And the reason why I'm thinking this is, uh, let me just show one quick slide, is what they showed was that when they go through this structure module, uh, they go from maybe GDT about 78 to 90. Yeah. Uh, and this is actually a pretty large jump. Um, and but it still doesn't explain the 20 to 70. That's, that's the part. Well, well, yeah. I'll go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Debbie, I interrupted you. No, no, no. I'm interrupting too much. I'm going. <laughs> Oh, no worries. So, so the thing is, it's, um, well, at least I'm, I'm trying to explain, say, okay, how do we go from, let's say, what the Baker Lab did to the Alpha Fold? And I think the, this module, the structure module, is doing something magical. Now, the question is, what is it doing? Um, so it turns out what this mo structure module is doing, let me, sorry, go back a few slides here. Um, it, it, it takes some initial coordinates, and this is the step that we're not quite sure exactly how they did. So they, they built some initial coordinates and then they take this cloud of, of coordinates and pass it to a transformer. And what the transformer model in this case is doing is looking at this one atom and says, okay, who are the neighbors? And based on some neighbors, it proposes how to move all the other atoms. Um, it, so it's almost like doing MD where you're sort of looking at your neighbors and you're computing some kind of potential and you're taking a step and you just sort of doing this. But the idea is here, you can sort of unroll this uh, 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 transformation step by step by step until you get a, a better coordinates. Um, and there has been two papers um, that specifically tried to use transformers. I mean, there might have been more, but these are the ones that I think they may have been inspired by. Uh, one is using this, this equivariant transformer, uh, which is doing exactly that aspect. Uh, and then also a paper from Facebook where they also looked at atoms and sort of try to propose the energy for each of the uh, uh, coordinates and sort of how to, and they were able to predict sort of rotomers and so on. Um, but here, this is just using energies. Here, it actually does propose moves based on all your surrounding neighbors. Um, and, and I guess for the Rosetta people out there, uh, I, I like to think of this sort of a neuralizing the, rel uh, the relax protocol. So you start with some coordinates and you sort of relax and you move it around until you get better coordinates at the end. But you effectively neuralize this thing and you potentially learned energy function in itself. Um, and, and so for me, I think the part that I'm most excited about to know is like, could we actually take this thing out from this model and use it to sort of refine models that were not even created with this whole architecture? Uh, is, is, it, is this effectively a neuralized Rosetta Relax protocol? Um, and, and, and I think for, for me, that, that's, that's what I'm kind of excited about um, to, to find out what. Uh, okay, so I, I think I've, I've uh, said it a little too many things. Um, I think that's all I had as far as slides. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and I'll let people ask questions and then we, Mohammed, and I guess Debbie could also chip in and answer some of these. I'm not shy. I mean, one thing I'll just add to what Sugi was said about this, the, the transformer piece. I do think if there is any kind of general principles of folding, or whatever, that, that are being learned by this network, it, it most likely will be in that, in that module, I suspect, because it's, at least from the way they described it anyway, it sounded like they're really operating on the kind of the atomic cloud and they sort of, you know, at that point, it sounds like they forget about the MSA and they forget about you know, the sequences and all these things, and they're just really operating on these things. So, um, so, so I, I mean, I, I agree with Sergey. I, I mean, I do think this is this is exciting, and I and I do suspect. I mean, setting aside Alpha Fold Two, that there's been a lot of work, particularly in the in the um, quantum chemistry literature, but increasingly in even kind of the protein MD space, where people are sort of essentially neutralizing these force fields. Um, it's typically trained on, you know, an actual for, on, on some some better force field like a quantum mechanical one. Um, so, so, so that that to me, I think it's, it's sort of a, a generally just an exciting direction to go into. All right. Uh, any, any other questions or concerns? So, just to double check my understanding, so this three uh, D uh, transformer, right, is could that be sort of thought of like trained on molecular dynamics, uh, just like data set as in like, I could potentially model like MD any uh, atom cloud, right? And then train some sort of model like that on that as, as a ground, like as input and ground truth. Um, or is uh, it mean, something different? So, so in, in this case, I, I don't think that's what they did. Um, I, I just think that this is, they may have learned something that does that without explicitly doing that. Um, and I mean, if you actually explicitly train it to do, I guess, MD, then maybe you could even do a better job. Um, 
But here it was, um, sorry, I was looking to see some. Actually, you know what? Let me send you guys the slides that I was just showing just in case anybody wants to. Did they talk about the tokens, what they were in that? Do you know it was only atom based or? Oh, uh, actually, the, this is the cool part. So they mm -hmm. said that apparently this transformer, as it's iterating, is mm -hmm. adding the side chains as well. Right, so, so, um, it's so it's not just exactly. So, so they start off. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go, 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 go. Uh, so, so they start off by initially representing the protein as these little triangles, mm -hmm. um, and it starts off with these triangles, and then they sort of feed these in. And the reason why you have triangles is because this angle is fixed, this angle is fixed, and this dihedral is fixed. And so you could represent most of the protein as these bunch of little triangles. Um, and that's just making the first initial coordinates, but then somehow these triangles get converted to full structure. And what they say here is that this equivariant transformer also builds the side chains. Um, and, and one thing that's been known forever in, in the field is if you have side chains, this is what actually allows you to get really, really good structure because, um, because the, the backbone information or the co even the coalition information gives you sort of a rough fold, but once you throw in the side chain and you even start doing some kind of relaxation or MD, you start to then start to approach cases where you're now getting all the details right. Uh, here well, what they're like showing- In natural language models where you have, you could have just the alphabet, right? Whatever the language is, or you could have, you know, byte, uh, pair byte encoding or something, right? Where you, are finding regular threemers or formers without doing all of them. And you can imagine that this is how it's, the math is being done. Um, they must have had other tokens in here and even numbers of them would work very well, I think. Yeah, so, so, so I, yeah, I guess every node could be represented as some kind of, uh, uh, you could probably give it some information about uh, like what kind of atom it is and so on and so. We have learned some kind of way to refine those guides. Yeah, well, one thing actually just, I, I, I do wonder as a, a technical point, but, but my sense I suspect is they're not actually really operating on, on points. It's not like they're operating on some sort of oriented object. Um, you know, the, the, this notion of a triangle. So because, because a lot of, you know, these equivalent tensor networks that they're often able to operate on tensors, right? So you, you could have things that are, that are geometrically more complicated than just a point, uh, just a point, right? Uh, with, 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 you know, with intrinsic orientation, things like that. So it sounded like that, that is part of what, what they were doing. Um, although what, one thing that did surprise me is that they're not actually, it sounds like they're not actually imposing anything like a chain structure on these oriented triangles. So, so they, they just kind of, you know, they're just sort of uh, <laughs> dreaming up these sort of whatever, these things in space. And then it even sounds like initially they're actually fairly clashy, but then through this sort of iteration, uh, process that they, they use all these clashes and they get something that looks more more physical but it didn't sound like they're actually imposing any kind of uh, constraints on the on the kind of the covalent geometry of the of the polypeptide chain yeah but even a pots model gets the chain well i mean this is a question that i, I think is sort of a, a it's not very clear about what they did which is that they are going though right from the from the pots model to 3d coordinates and that there's some sort of interconversion that's happening. And I mean, you're right, of course, but, but if they are generating it in a differentiable way, there's these sort of 3D coordinates, right. in a principle, at least you could have them do also, I mean, it's not like they, they are doing funky things in the beginning and that they have to kind of be cleaned up. Yes, so I mean, one thing they, they, they made a point during one of the presentations was that, um, that during the training procedure that it actually started, like these triangles were not connected to each other in any way. Okay. They were some kind of gas and they were just floating around uh, and that the model learned to bring them the, the ones that are close together. And I guess that that's not too surprising because if you introduce some kind of positional information, you say, okay, this is residue one, two, and three, the model will learn, hey, you should probably bring these triangles close enough to each other. Um, that's so actually that's what happens if you use a distance, old fashioned distance geometry algorithms that in which nobody uses anymore, even in NMR, they all use simulated annealing at the very worst, you know, uh, but the old ones, they used to make these sort of triangles of relationships all over the place, literally, <laughs> and then they had to be pulled together. They pulled them automatically together with other distances, but I think that, I agree, I think that would be the, what's happening. Um, I mean, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yes. Um, all right, any, any other questions? Uh, oh. I had a very big picture uh, type of question. Um, at the cast meeting, I, I asked the AlphaFold uh, people if they plan to 
have this as a server, um, you know, so that the community could use it. And they uh, actually completely dodged my question. <laughs> but but I, I, and I and I know that you know for Alpha Hold Fold One, you know, uh, many groups used um, you know what what they published uh, on that. I guess my general question is: is uh, is protein structure prediction really for only those? With a ton of computational power at this point. I mean, you know, I, I was in the Baker Lab for anybody who, um, you know, is, is is thinking that I'm against this sort of thing. Um, and you know, we, 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 Baker Baker has Rosetta at home, which is one of the biggest distributed computing projects out there. Um, and now AlphaFold, although they did mention, you know, it didn't take that much. It was really all the training that that used the the computations. I guess, yeah, it was, that was my general question. Yeah. You about that? I'll make a quick comment on that. Uh, this is Chris. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm out walking actually. That you know, when we first uh, uh, folded uh, the correct fold for multiple sequence alignments using the what's called the POTS model or the co-evolution co co or the original couplings, we had a slide that had an IBM supercomputer where people had tried as a century of project to follow the proteins using motion dynamics. And then we had the illusionary coupling to sequence alignments, which for the first time gave correct folds actually 10 years ago. And, uh, and we put them next to each other and saying, hey, why don't we do it on a laptop? So that's a joke that indicates that you've got to get the thing right. It's not computational power. It's the intelligence of capturing the neurological problem and then finding the right kind of methods as you've been discussing for the last hour or so to get it right. I think some really good ideas of how to go beyond the alpha fold in a simpler way and one that's really transparent and solve it even on a small computer. That's my opinion. Thank you, Chris. I, I didn't I didn't know you were here. Um, my, my concern with CASP though is is you know the winners that you know get all the all the all the press and everything are are going to be the ones that that do have uh, all that power, and so I'm I'm worried about the, the small groups that that maybe are are very close to getting that right answer. Lots of smart people, and some of them are in this room. Uh, they can do it uh, with just smartness, and then a bit of computing. Yes. Um, and, and, and this to me okay. is, is a broader problem. I mean, if you look at machine learning as a whole, right? I mean, it's, it's sort of, it's, 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 it's gotten hard, right? For academic groups, even well-funded, well-resourced to compete with the Googles and the Facebooks. I mean, I don't- I don't agree. You, you don't agree? I don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> I mean- Well, I mean, I think it depends on the, on, the, on the type of science, right? I think certain science, you, you could still do very much within, within sort of small academic groups, but, but at least the, the kind of, the, right. the, the, the scale science, the, high, the large scale science, that seems to be quite hard. Well, I don't know what we mean by that. I mean, I, I sort of understand what you mean, certainly in this case, right? That a lot of compute power is needed. It's not option. It's not an option for, you know, new groups starting out or even established ones to use that. But there are other questions in which you can use neural machines for which uh, not a lot of compute power is needed. And in fact, Facebook and Google are not doing well with it. Right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, like for instance, variant effect prediction. <laughs> uh, um, where with no, all the power I, yeah. in the world, they haven't done anything, right, basically. <laughs> yeah, so, no, so I, in that, on that point, I completely I agree. I think there, there are far too many problems, you know, for, for any one company to sort of corner the market on them. No, I, I, I didn't mean to imply that. I, I just meant that there are certain kinds of problems, you know, which pushing such a prediction maybe is one of them, where it seems to sort of really pay mm -hmm. off to have, I mean, I, I think where we've seen this the most is in particularly like with open AI with these sort of like natural language models where they're, you know, essentially throwing tens of millions of dollars of compute to, to train a single, a single like, like GPT-3, for example, right? Those models, it seems right, right, like right, it's, right. It's, it's quite hard to compete for academic groups. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I mean maybe, maybe what this ought to be sort of, um, you know, this ought to encourage us to try to kind of come up with some sort of federated, you know, we, we ought to get the government to sort of build up these sort of big GPU farms and allow us to use them. I mean, I think I, this may be more of a- Well, think a, about doing it differently. I mean, you know, it wasn't the case, you know, IBM had Deep Blue, which I think was meant to solve the protein building problem in whatever it was, 1997. I don't know what year it was. Um, <clears throat> because it was huge and it fitted in three rooms or something. Um, and that's what it seems. It probably did the best then, right? But it's not the case. You can think of new ways of doing things. I would encourage anybody who wants to think about the relationship between stru sequence structure and function to try things that avoid having to do it like that. <laughs> okay. Just to add to that, I mean, there's something, there's something, sorry, if I may, sorry for 
Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. And, you know, there's, there's, there's something in the medium, you know, costs are coming down. So we're, we're running some machine learning. I think if we're the center, we're using 10 GPUs. It sounds expensive, but these things are available. You don't have to be Google necessarily. So maybe a laptop is enough for some things, but getting a computer center with a number of GPUs, it's all doable these days. So there's something in the medium, I think, where I would encourage people Use the tools which are out there, you know, transform, et cetera, et cetera. Apply them intelligently and try to bring it down to the available complete resources. And then uh, uh, you don't have to be scared about the Google or Facebook. Yeah, I guess uh, two uh -oh. points I wanted to make while Chris is trying to reconnect. Um, uh, one thing I, I remember K Kasparov gave an a interview and he, he mentioned that this deep uh, uh, blue gene, whatever it's called, uh, computer is now um, is actually as powerful as our phone is today um, is and so so you can probably imagine 10 years from now uh, all those TPUs exactly. can probably fit inside our phone um, but the uh, the second point I wanted to make is that uh, I, I like to think of, of us scientists to some extent as being sort of gold prospectors uh, like we're going around finding for some initial interesting signal um, and we probably don't have all the equipment to dig out all the gold, but once we show that there's that signal, then somebody comes in with massive tractors and digs everything up. Um, oh, that's my so, excuse. You can't use it. Um, well, I maybe, maybe I'll also just chime in and say and okay. remind everybody that Oak Ridge National Laboratory has leadership class compute that you just write a proposal to and you get access to it. Yeah, yeah. So any lab, big or small, new or established can get access to ludicrous amounts of CPU through the US government bridge. Exactly, just an application does it, you're right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, I guess uh, right right now, um, it, it is a little scary. Like let's say if you wanted to make the next big step uh, there, you would you probably do need hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of compute power to be able to, to do that. I didn't agree. Um, well, it's because there's two parts to it. One is, okay, if you're just replicating, you probably don't need that much money. You could probably replicate the algorithm with maybe a, a few hundred dollars. Uh, but if you want to say develop things and you're doing a huge architecture search, that's where the huge amount of power goes into play. Uh, I mean, they may have told us the algorithm and tomorrow you could probably replicate it exactly with just a hundred bucks. Um, but to get to that point required uh, probably infinite all of Google power for for many, many, almost maybe two years of, of exploration. Um, and so the question is to make that next step, do we need that much exploration power? Uh, and I think that's where it gets a little, like as far as making the best next neural network um, to do even better. And I should be honest, I mean, I think beyond computer, I think it's the human resources, right? I mean, the fact that they have like 30 full-time people working on this, you know, professionals who've, who've been there for several years and they have me institutional memory and all that stuff. That, that I think is the harder part to replicate. And they're not worried about their jobs and they all came right. to David Shaw, so they were already right. well paid. Yeah. Not getting grants, you know, that stuff, right? That, that's, that's the part that's that. But I think, but I think we you know. are ignoring the fact that advances don't always only build. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that those things are not important and that anybody with, you know, in their back garden can compete. I agree. But I do think that one way to think about these things is what do we want to get? What do we want to know? If the argument is we want to know these structures so that we can do drug design, say for instance, like what would be the best way to be able to do that and to get there? And how would we design a research project on that? And it wouldn't necessarily be to do the same as Arpaful. No, and I think, I think your, your point, Debbie, earlier about there being multiple, like in you know, a variant prediction, other problems, I think, I think that that is where I think they will start to in some ways, going out of steam, right? Because they've been super focused, laser focused, on this one problem that has a leaderboard and it's a very kind of clear cut story, right? That, that, that's, and they're good at playing games, and that's sort of it's very much kind of placed to that strength. But I think once you start getting into a situation where, where it's really more about scientific questions, like what is actually interesting, and, and how do you solve this problem for this particular niche that is, you know, very high value, I, I suspect they'll have a harder time competing because they, I mean, even thirty people won't be enough. You know, you'll you'll, you'll need yeah, maybe. yeah. Um, All right, and any other questions that folks have? Um, I have a much more general question. So uh, in this method, do you envision there to be any problems with a protein size or with uh, multi-domain proteins? 
Um, so depends how many are in the PDB because <laughs> they're copying structures that are crystals, right? Sorry. <laughs> um, as far as being able to fit the whole protein into memory, I mean, that, that definitely was an issue that they discussed. Um, and that's actually part of the reason why they use TPUs. Apparently they have lots and lots of memory. Um, and uh, I think it's like 128 gigs of RAM, Mohammed, if that's correct. Um, yeah. And they were able to fit some of these targets that were literally uh, 4,000, I believe, amino acids uh, and, and build the whole target in one go. Uh, so, so, but that's, if you have a, t uh, a mini, mini TPU strung together, uh, I don't think you could, you can, oh yeah, 3,000, uh, Pear corrected me. Um, it's, so, so with, with their resources, I don't think memory is an issue. Uh, with our resources, um, we, even with our really simple models, we sort of start to run out of memory after you hit about 300, 400 amino acids. Um, yeah, I mean, this model, I was just going to share the screen. So this is an interesting one. I think this is about 2,000 residues. And they, they initially, they said for the CAS14 submission, they actually chopped it up into different domains and then predicted it that way because they didn't have their system up and running for, for these long proteins. Um, but, but, then, but then the one they're showing here was, was predicted as a single chain, um, but, but obviously comprised of multiple domains. Um, what's interesting though, I mean, you, you do see, you know, you, you do see some, some, some bad, bad, at least domain packing, um, particularly, you know, on the, sort of on the left side. So, so, so on these very big ones, I think I, I would say the jury's out on whether they can really model them well yet. I think that one of the issues here is that we can think about the crystals that are, or the structures for whatever the method that sold them that are available cover a certain space of some imaginary space of all of them. But now you come to multi-domain and I think the sampling of that that we have available that we look at is tiny, <laughs> it's tiny. So whether there's enough even to learn from, even if you have the biggest computer in the world, it, that will be interesting to know, to see. Is that that for multi-domain stuff, it's uh, also a question whether the experimental ground truth is actually representing the state of the protein like in solution or something like that. Well, even if it wasn't, we still are, are sampling all the all the multi-domain all the multi-domain proteins that we know are very poorly sampled, you know, in 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 structure in, in the structural database compared to what there is in reality. So and is a tiny fraction of all the, so it's all about sampling, I think, and the possible, it's a complicated question. I don't think it's only about size. And yeah, one of the questions is, is the crystal the only confirmation? And, you know, I'm, I'm a boring old person that always raises that and I hate myself for it because, you know, some people like crystals, so that's fine. <laughs> I find them very boring because they're stuck. Oh, there'd be one question. I'm so curious what you think about this because, you know, my sense was that one of, one of the power of, of the sort of the, the kind of covariance based approaches is that you're actually, you, it's not, per, I mean, obviously what they're doing is supervised, but at least kind of in sort of, it's sort of pure form. It's not a supervised approach, right? You're really just working off of sequences. Mm -hmm. And so, and so from, from that perspective, at least the, the, the big multi-domain proteins, I mean, I, I guess you do have shallow alignments, all things being equal. Well, I but, think, right. So, Absolutely, and there are papers, we haven't actually published these and we've done them in the lab. I think we had a summer student, if Kelly's here, doing exactly that. You know, yes, when you've got the alignment, you're done, you're done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's extremely <laughs> unlikely that you'd be able to do that in a supervised way necessarily, but then how often, as you said, these domains are shuffling around in evolution. So how many times do you see it in that you know, order and therefore what are the alignments like uh, is a very good question. And that's an area where I think using non-alignment methods and learning from the ways in which these things come together in sequence space um, <clears throat> might be a big um, boost to doing those proteins. Yeah. And after all, the, the sort of structural community that isn't the prediction community, but is more the structural biology community their question now is how do things move? Um, how, you know, what's, what happens if there's these mutations and 
oh, these com these things are added to the complex, and those things are just we can't go anywhere near. Most people can't go anywhere near them in the prediction area as yet. Um, I, I guess related to that, um, so so this target. Sorry, I have to correct myself. Uh, it turns out it's only two thousand one hundred residues or so, um, and oh, that's small. And for that one, it actually turns out that it, there is plenty of sequences available. So if you have no templates, you should still be able to predict it pretty well. Was um, that a repeat protein, by the way? Uh, no, it was uh, many really different proteins. I'm sorry, many different domains. That <laughs> I think it was three different domains, right? Uh, they didn't have loads of IgG. More, yeah. maybe, maybe more. I think they showed three. They, uh, they broke it down into, uh, at least the CASP organizers broke it down into 10 domains. Oh, never mind. Um, and this is the target where there was actually quite a lot of sequences. So you could uh, do a pretty good job at predicting yeah. contacts for it. Um, yeah, so, so I, I think one thing that probably is on everybody's mind is, did they solve the protein folding problem? And I guess at, at least both, I guess all three of us are sort of getting at there, used a lot of information. Um, and we won't really know until they do the ablation studies. And but also, you know, it's a badly, po it could be, solving the protein folding problem is a badly posed question, right? One has to be more specific about what one means. That's oh, sorry. Uh, let, let me rephrase that. So what I mean by protein folding problem is uh, not using experimental data, um, just using only the information that's available for when the protein falls inside the cell. Uh, so when you, right. use, when you use sequences, that's experimental data. When you use uh, any templates, that's experimental data. So, so I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Having a model understand this without knowing anything about uh, uh, other proteins out there, how they fold, and so on. So, I mean, I guess so. It's like learning the the physics of how a protein folds, and and have the network understand that aspect of it. Um, at least that's the way I was always defining it. Uh, and so, so that's why I'm saying it's not solving the protein folding problem yet. At least from what we know, is because they use this extra information. Well, way off that, right? I mean, everybody mm -hmm. is. <laughs> No, I think I think we're, yeah, I, I agree. I, I think we're quite quite a ways off from that. And, and, I, and I also agree. I mean, I think in some ways, if, if we were able to do that, I would almost venture to say that that, that is what almost implies that we have some handle on protein conformational ensembles at least. So yeah. it, it, it feels like that that would be kind of a much much deeper kind of yeah, yeah. solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the audience? or points you want to make? I, um, I came in late, so apologies. Uh, this has already been discussed and thanks so much, um, Sergey and Mohammed for, for leading the discussion today. Um, and, and Debbie for coming in and, and Chris uh, and, and, and making really insightful contributions. Um, I'm sort of thinking about the next steps, right? Like. AlphaFold 1 hit the scene and they were a bit better than everybody else. And it sort of sparked, I think, a lot of people to start thinking about working in this space and along these lines. And now they've made a- That's the one positive thing, Chris. Yeah. And AlphaFold 2 has made a really big leap, right? But I guess what I'm wondering uh, is um, sort of, um, where do we go from here, right? Like, um, is AlphaFold 3 going to continue this march in two years, do you think? Or is academia going to catch back up? How are, how are we going to do this? Yeah, I'm just sort of just wondering what people thinking about, like, what, what happens next? What happens in the next two years? They're going to go down the silo of getting every side chain and every atom in it in exactly the position of a crystal and all the um, uh, complexes exactly like that. And they're not going to necessarily solve the problem of how things come together dynamically, which is the big open thing, I think, you know, especially we're all interested. That's the way it's motivated in every paper that most people write is what about the ligands? What about the drugs, you know? Um, <clears throat> so, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure. That, Mohammed, right? So I, I'm not sure. I'm well, we'll see. I mean, I mean, in some ways it, it probably depends on their kind of their, their, their objective function. Um, my my me, sense, Deep points, I mean, or demises. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that they care about, uh, you know, big sort of PR stories, right? big headlines. And so I actually, I don't think they will double down on the protein structure problem per se. Like, you know, what you're saying is all the atoms, because they've already made the claim that they solved that, right? 
So, so I think for them, like solving Capri, you know, for protein complexes, that would be like, the, I, I think. But that's the same, uh, yeah, but that's what I mean. That's it, okay. No, no, I mean, so, so they about like, quaternary complexes, right? So about, about, about kind of bigger molecular that's machines and that kind of They've thing. They've already done it, actually. <laughs> um, well, so, 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 so that, that's my suspicion is that they're gonna, I, so I mean, just to Chris, to your point, I think anything that has a leaderboard, <laughs> I think they, they will try to, to attack, right? Because that, that is the closest to game playing. And, and, that, and that's, I think is very much kind of in the, in the company DNA. I think things that are a lot less clear and, and that, that justify um, sort of rationalizing, like that, that, that require you to explain why that, why there are interesting problems, those I think they'll stay away from. Because I, I think they want to tackle problems that everybody agrees on, are, are, are everybody, a large fraction of people agree on are important so that, so that they can easily get the headlines. Well, I mean, I guess you, you also need to somehow demonstrate that you're uh, actually doing good. I mean, historically before CASP, uh, supposedly a lot of people claim that they solved the problem uh, many, many times. And, um, and it was only during the competition, like these CASP competition that we started to realize, hey, actually no one actually solved the problem yet. Um, and so it's, it, I mean, it makes sense that they would only focus on things where there's a really uh, great way to evaluate these things. But I'm sorry, but CASP people. isn't the only way. You have tens of thousands of structures in a database and you could look at the distance between them and the ones you want to predict and you could have you know benchmarks as you know where well, unfortunately the problem is this tiny tiny thing where people happen to have kept it under the seat for you know and john and the other people organize it are fantastic and i love them but compared to what they should do which is show it on how generalizable is it here's we only use alpha Right? Can we do alpha and beta if we only try on alpha? Probably not. Can you do alpha, beta, alpha if you turn on alpha, beta, beta, alpha? You know, these are the things we want to know, right? Not just cast random stochastic choices from groups that happen to donate their structures. Um, so, I mean, the, the point- I, actually, I, agree, that, I very much agree with that. I know, um, you, I, I, I know, yeah, I know. Yeah. So, 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 I mean, the thing is like, even if you think that you've made a really good benchmark and that you've separated training from test set, um, if you keep accidentally looking at your test, just even occasionally, you are effectively using that. And I think many, many people- It's reproducible. Uh, you need reproducible. It needs, you put your code in with your paper, yeah. don't you? And you know- I, 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 don't, I don't think the problem is, I mean, I think machine learning is already, the, the field of machine learning has always solved this. I mean, I understand maybe the protein structure world had a sort of a bad checkered history. But I think in other places, people have, this is not a problem. I mean, as long as you have sort of good standards of, of sort of research hygiene, this should well, be- That's what I solved. thought until yeah. I started talking to the language people. <laughs> uh, say it's also littered with bad test training splits, but you know, that's yeah. another discussion. Right, so I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's why you sort of need these blind it's experiments in order way to- of overcoming that problem. Hey, you guys can't be honest. And you don't have to put your code in because it's the year 1997 with your paper. So we're going to make a competition where you can't see it. Great. But now we have tens of thousands of structures. Let's see how generalizable you are as a function of what you trade on and as a function of the sequence depth. You know, let's do those studies. That might not even be necessary anymore with Cameo, which is a weekly. Right. Okay. Run. Point. So just if, as long as everybody creates a server that, you know, obviously the public could use, then you just enter it on Cameo every week, done. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I agree with that, actually. Yeah, I like Cameo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess I guess the, the last point I was gonna make related to that, it's, I, I don't think anyone um, purposely tries to say that they won, um, it's, it's often by accident. Oh, totally. Um, it's not about it's, fraud, it's about, well, I'm just going to optimize this tiny parameter and, you know, otherwise I don't get trips in. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. And so, I mean, that's why I was saying that we need these kind of blind experiments. Yeah, but I mean, we can do it better. actually did the correct thing. That was invented um, in the 90s. We can do better than that for benchmarking now. Well, just, okay. I, mean, I, well, I think from, from the perspective of, of, of generating that. headlines anyway, I think it's obviously a lot easier if, if there's no question, right? No, no one's going to go and say Google cheated. But yeah, I think in that sense, I think you guys say it's 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 a it's a demonstration that that is hard to sort of challenge on the basis of of, of these kinds of questions, right? It, it's very kind of clear cut. 
so, and, and, and particularly as a, in, in a relative sense, right? They, they did much better than the second best group. So at least in, in that regard, they kind of, it's, it's, it's very clear cut. But then if you then do, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm not gonna argue, but if you look at the distribution of structures over CASP over the years, and you can optimize the kind of things you need to be better at in order to win that competition, don't think that they didn't look at that. <laughs> and the other thing is that you, <clears throat> so you can still be not blind, but the other thing I think that's, I do like what you said, Sergey, in a way, but I think that we do have much more open culture now of being able to check code and run things and than when CASP started and that's all. I mean, maybe maybe in some ways, what what CAS does provide is, is is in some ways a standardized experiment, right? I think maybe that's a challenge. But not when you use if you use CASP in the past, then you're doing the same as cutting out a bit of PDB. No, no, I I completely agree, but I think that maybe that's a challenge in some like nascent fields, right? Nascent fields is that oftentimes you have different groups claiming different things, and they never campaign on the same thing, so it's hard oh, to yeah. really say who's doing better, right? So in that sense, it's sort of it's it's kind of there's a there's a standardized thing that everybody everybody sort of agrees on, and so in that that regard, again, it's easy for them to like claim to this. It's it's easy for, it's easy for them to generate the headlines and get the BBC to write about them when when there is that sort of uh, competition. Yeah, like the lowest denominator, right? I, I will say actually that one thing I do really like is that the BBC did cover it, and the lowest common denominator heard about protein folding. Oh no! They're taking some of the brain power that they're the calls I got. These you took professional them. sports. And they're learning about something that matters in the world, right? This was incredibly good. And the more the public focuses on science instead of frivolous things, we're all better off. So in that regard, I would say I tip my hat to CASP. Whether or not it, it does anything. Oh, I agree with that. I agree with that. Lot, culturally, it's incredibly important. I say no to competitions, but I'm just a sad person. Well, I, th I don't think they think of themselves as doing competitions. It's always like a critical assessment. So uh, it's it, an experiment. Experiment. It's <laughs> always experiment. <laughs> well, as you know, I've never entered any, which is because I'm a fake. Totally. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much, guys, for doing that tonight. Thank you. And thank you, Chris, for your positive remarks. That was really nice. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. Thanks, everybody. Glad, glad you you to show up to one of these, so it's really exciting. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to give a talk. I'm always good to give a talk. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. This is great. Bye.